Hey everyone, welcome back to the Beyond the Arc podcast. My name is Matthew Ho, and in today's episode, me and my co-host uh, Yash, aka Math Cabal on Twitter, we start our preview pod series leading up to the upcoming NBA season. So in this episode, we talk about the Detroit Pistons, the Washington Wizards, and Charlotte Hornets. We're starting with the three worst teams um, in each conference. They're going to work our way up all the way to number one. Um, episode runs at about an hour. On another note, this summer I was working for the Southern California News Group. Um, just wrapped that up and had a story that should be out by the time this podcast released about the House First NCAA uh, case. And that was that made headlines a couple months ago because part of that settlement was players and schools having revenue sharing between them uh, for you know future broadcast rights. And there's also going to be back pay to you know athletes dating back all the way to 2016 um so there was a school in southern california loyola marymount university who cut six sports at the beginning of this year in january january 23rd to be exact and one of the reasons they cited was the changing ncaa landscape and where that is going to be heading in the next couple of years so if you look up you know la daily news oc register i'll probably tweet it out on my own twitter as well at mho underscore kj um, so if you guys are interested in that and want to learn more about it, check out my Twitter for that as well. Um, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Now we're looking at the bottom three Eastern Conference teams. Um, Yash, you've been talking about Cade Cunningham for the past like two, three days. So what you got <laughs> on him? Yeah, I mean, I'm ex- I was excited for for this part because I – just because I just wasn't able to in the past. Like this is my first real experience, like getting getting to dive into the – Cade's game, Cade's game, and uh, I, I came out of it like a fan. Like I think Cade is is great, and he's he, like obviously he's the focal point of this Pistons team, and maybe the the one bright spot they've had in their 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 last three seasons. Like I I, I mean we, we all remember like the the infamous Detroit losing streak at, at the start of the year, Ooh, yeah. uh, where it was just like Cade killing, and then they just still kept losing just because of their circumstances. Um, but I, 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 Cade's really good. Like he's six, eight, uh, can handle the ball. He's, he's going to be like a, a primary ball handler wherever he goes. Uh, but I think last year he really fine tuned his scoring. Um, uh, he, he's, his mid range game in particular was, was, was really shined last year. He was, um, uh, I think 70 percentile getting to the mid range out of pick and roll. Like that's a, re- a reliable scoring option for him. Um, moving forward. Um, obviously he has athletic concerns. Like we, we, t- we've talked about this extensively in the past. Like he's not someone that's quick. He's not someone that's explosive, uh, either in terms of quickness or, or vertical explosiveness, but I think he has solutions to get around it. Namely with his, his shooting, his touch, uh, his, 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 his handle and, and his vision. So, um, I think the the fact that Detroit has someone like K that they can build around, it already puts them in a pretty good position. Uh, but it's it's just can they figure out the surrounding talent? That's the question for them. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I guess Cade wasn't a big needle mover enough for our uh, our what our uh, the past five years draft. Yeah, but I've, I've matured. Since then. I've matured since then. So got yeah. last place. Had Cade that, Kenny and, and Paulo Bancaro, but no. You're, let's, you're, do, let's do Jalen Williams, number one offensive option. All right. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, and that was some, that was some that was an interesting pull. Yeah. Um but yeah, I mean they d- did add some, you know, so they added some players around Cade Cunningham. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Yeah. Tobias Harris, uh, Tim Hardway Jr., Malik Beasley, some mm-hmm. true snipers on that team now. That I mean they they definitely had a need in mind uh <laughs> come from last year like when you, when they had Isaiah Stewart with the running lineup so Isaiah Stewart I saw Thompson, like Killian multiple Hayes. Non- oh. Killian Hayes, like they had, they had no shooting last year, and so at least they had a direction with what they with what what they wanted to take things this year. They got a lot of shooters, um, so I mean they they chose a direction. But again, like those are all guys that have have come from, you know, that have played significant roles on winning teams. Like Tim Hardaway Jr., longtime starter. Tobias Harris, longtime starter on Philly. Um, Malik Beasley just started on. Uh, the box last year, like those guys are going to want touches. Those guys are going to want usage. And so again, like sort of similar situation to Portland in our, in our last episode that we talked about, they have, they have established guys that are going to need to play and get touches. 
the question is, does it, is that going to take away from Detroit's young core? And, you know, we could talk about the young core. Yeah. Um, I, I want to talk about that topic, though, about the sure. we alluded to it last episode, too. Like, are the veterans pulling in the same direction as the organization and the young core? I think it depends on the buy-in J.B. Baker staff can get, right? Because if if it gets to the point where like it's every man for themselves and you see Tim Hardway Jr. getting like a handful of pick and rolls every game. Okay. It, it's, it's cooked. Like just bench him at that point. Um, but if you can get them to buy in like, Hey, this is a role you would play for a contending team, more of like a spot up closeout type of role for beat my Malik Beasley, Tim Hardway, Tobias Harris. So if you guys like play a role well around Kate Cunningham, you know, that that'll show another team's front office. Hey, like they can bring this or that, you know, so it depends on the buy-in, though. Like, he's going to have to get those guys to buy in into playing that sort of way for this to all work out. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good point. And I think uh, Tobias, might be, it might be trickier to, to make that work with him versus the other two, not because of, of him or any slight on him as, as a person or as a player or anything, but I'm just saying, like, they paid him to come over to Detroit. I think there, there's some, some politics that, that come with that. Like, he, he knows he's coming in. To, to play a bigger role than he was in Philly. So I think with him, it might be a little tougher to work around, but I think you make a good point with Tim Hardaway, Malik Beasley, those guys, those guys want to get back to to where they were um, on a winning team. So th- th- I think that there's a chance that they can buy into a role. Yeah. And with Tobias too, um, you know, I think they do need just some sort of offensive second option or like some guy that's going to be at least somewhat reliable uh, I did. I like Jay and Ivy. I looked into him for this specific preview because I knew you looked at Kate. Okay, I'll look at Jay and Ivy. Um, sure. So I, I, I dug into him a bit, but I, you know, he's not. He's in only in his third third year, I think. Third season, right? Yeah. Uh huh. Third yeah. season. Um. So, you know, I think Tobias is probably get a little bit more of a solid option in terms of like late shot clock. You need something or like a bench unit guy. Like Tobias is going to be a little bit more reliable. Um, so I think he'll bring that, but I also don't think he's going to necessarily take away from, you know, Kate or Jane Ivy or Asar Thompson, Ron Holland. Um, he's, he's not like a super ball dominant player. You know, he's more like, you know, one, two dribble pull-ups, like quicker stuff like that. So, um, I think it'll, it'll all work out. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, we can start talking about the young core. I mean, you you talk, talked a little bit about Kay. Do you have anything else to add about him, about what you like specifically in this context? Sure. I mean, he just, he, he's just he's a reliable go-to guy. Uh, he has – he's a, I think he's just really well-rounded in terms of what he can do for an offense. Like the scoring is what he had to figure out, but he's, he's already a dynamic playmaker as well. He has great vision. Um, it reminds me of a Luca Tatum archetype where he's a guy that can score, but also, uh, you know, make any pass at the, uh, uh, any pass on the, on the court at six, eight, uh, can, can see the entire floor and make reads. And so I think he's already established Like he's going to uh, next year might be a year where he gets first all, all-star appearance, but he's going to have multiple down the line. I think he's, he's a, is a pretty, pretty clear cut star. Uh, if not this year, maybe down the line. So they they definitely got. They, they definitely have uh, you know something good with him. Yeah, because I know some people have talked about him like, hey, is this guy really going to be a number one option on a, on a championship team? So you're – Yeah, I get about it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. there's a lot – there's that whole notion like, hey, is this guy going to be like the number one option on a championship team? I think there's a lot more guys than you think in theory that could. It just like depends on your surrounding talent. That's true, and even if Kate isn't that, like, I, I, like just because you're a number one option on a championship team, or if you're not that, doesn't mean you can't be a number one option on just a, a competitive team. Like, if Detroit yeah, yeah. makes the playoffs, he's going to be the driving force of that. Yeah. So you know, I don't, I don't think that takes away from it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anything else to add about Cade? I'm just giving you the, no. the floor to do this because uh, you looked into him. Oh yeah. In depth. I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, I, again, as I talked about, like the, the, the jump shooting was the, the area I think that's really going to determine his ceiling. Uh, is he gonna, if he's a superstar shot maker, then I think he has a chance to be a superstar. But if, if the jumper is just at, an, uh, at, a, at, a, at a very good level, then I think that will limit him. Um, like Cade already, he's, 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 uh, I think what makes him uh, so adept at creating his own shot right now is his one, his size, and two, his, his ball handling. 
like uh, his his handle out of pick and roll like he's, he's someone that plays with pace kind of like Luca where you know he 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 throws in subtle hesitations uh crossovers he really he's good at really reading his defender and creating opportunities out of that and you know that's what allows him to get to his spots at ease uh whether that be in in the, in the pain or um in the mid range an area that I, I I found out that I underrated was his ability to get to the basket, uh, like or get to the rim. So because again, like he's he has he's not the most athletic guy, uh, like, especially among the star archetypes. But his he has great size, and that's something that he really uses to get to the basket. Uh, I got some numbers on that. So at a pick and roll, um, just for reference, someone like Jason Tatum gets to the rim at the seventy third percentile. Um, which, you know, for his usage and his role is really good. Uh, Cade's only a step below that. He's like 63rd, 64th percentile in getting to the getting to the rim out of pick and roll, which is pretty quality. Um, you know, someone like Luca, like, obviously Luca's a superstar. Getting to the paint isn't, getting to the rim in particular isn't his strong suit. Uh, but, you know, Luca's like 13th percentile or something like that. Uh, and so Cade's definitely, he's not, uh, I think he's definitely got more quickness than, than Luca. Uh, like I think Kate's got a pretty solid first step and uh, again, the size, which allows him to get to the rim. So uh, I don't think it's, it's as big of a concern as I, as I thought in the past, uh, which I think definitely helped inflate my outlook on him um, looking forward. But again, he, he gets to his mid range. He's a very good pull up three point shooter. Uh, he's like 75th percentile three point shooting out of pick and roll. Uh, he gets to his spots. He can play he has great touch so he can play out of the post, uh, get to his spots out of there as well. And so I think he has a lot of ways where he can create offense, draw advantages. And I mean, ultimately that's what you want out of a star. Like it's, it's how many ways can you create offense? Can you be a guy that draws in the defense and, and creates advantages? And I think he can definitely be that. Maybe just not at, an, at a superstar level, but at the very least, I think he's going to be a guy that makes multiple NBA teams, which is already a great outcome. Yeah, definitely. Hear you on that. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe we can pivot to his Hopefully his backcourt made Jaden Ivey, Monty Williams didn't think, so he thought it was Killian Hayes, but <laughs> uh, Jaden Ivey. It was crazy. Ivey getting benched as much as he did last year was, I mean, regardless of if he deserved it or not, like he, it was it, it, like just as someone needing touches, needing development, it was, it was unfortunate from that standpoint. Yeah. So last year, I mean, he didn't have a great year last year, but he still had some solid standout games. Um, I think particularly when his three ball is falling, like he looks really good um, because, you know, if, if you're forced to close out on him, he's super quick and strong. So he's going to be able to maintain that advantage at a pretty good level um, and can finish. So I think he definitely can be a number two next to Cade. And I think it's a cool dynamic they have too, where he's a little bit more of the quicker, more explosive guy. Cade's a little bit more methodical. Um so I like that. And he still averaged, you know, 15 points per game. Season before, average 16 points on about, you know, 34% uh, shooting from three last year. Uh, he had, only had 3.8 assists last year. That was down from 5.2 the year before. Um, but I think in this just overall better team context, I think you're going to see a little bit of a jump from um, Ivy. But, yeah, I, I guess what have you seen from him? Do you think he can be a number two? Yeah, I think I'm a little – a little more hesitant, I think, just because Kate is already as established as he is, and I obviously Ivy's younger. Um, but I, I, my worry is if if he can, I guess, quote unquote, catch up and become, you know, um, a, a steady, reliable contributor while he's developing, so that Detroit's able to take the steps they need. Like my worry is, like, it, it, is it, he might just not get that opportunity, like. I, I as good as he was last year, I, he had his ups and downs, and and so I don't think he was in overall like a you know a strong solid positive contributor. I think that's the question next year. Like, could he be, you know, a st- a steady, uh, reliable guy? Obviously, a young players going to make mistakes, but can he be, you know, a solid enough guy when he when he's getting the touches to where he could he can still help them win while while being you know while while, while growing? Because I mean, just just for reference, like he was. 47th percentile pick and roll ball handler last year, like, which is, you know, right around average. Um, he, he still needs, he still has growing to do with his game. And I, my, my worry is he's just, you know, does he, does he fit that same, uh, the same timeline that, that Cade's on? He's younger than Cade. He is younger. You're right. 
Yeah. But I'm, I'm just saying, like, Cade's already established. Like, is Ivy, is, is he ready, I guess? Oh, to, to help? okay, okay. What would you think about yeah, that? Yeah, well, I think, the, <laughs> I don't think there's really an, an option there. Like, who else are they going to put there that's ready? Right. So I, I think just by default, he's going to be in that spot. Um, obviously, they have some other young guys like Ron Holland, Asar Thompson. I think Asar started a bit last year at the beginning of the year. I remember because I, I had him on my fantasy team, and he just had like a crazy start to the year where he was getting like triple doubles, like 15 rebounds, like 10 assists, steals, blocks, everything. Like he was just going off. Um, but both those guys are a little bit of weird fits at the two guard spot just because they can't, they can't shoot at all. Like neither of those guys. At least Ivy can shoot a bit. I'm not saying Ivy's the best shooter ever, but more than Ron Holland and um, Ron Holland and uh, Asar Thompson. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think he he can be a number two for them moving forward. But I mean, worst comes to worst. I mean, you want him to develop, so maybe that's the guy you move down the line. So either way, you're gonna want him to improve. Um, maybe we can talk about some of their other young guys. Asar Thompson is I, just the Thompson twins in general. I just I really like the way they play. I know they're not the most conventional players but they just like make stuff happen on the core they just impact the game in so many ways um they're just so athletic good motor can defend will rebound just do literally anything you need to do and obviously the jump shot's not really there but um that's something that's always more on the the teachable side although his jump shot it, it was pretty bad last year it was bad but that might have been partially you know adjustments to the nba line he already wasn't a good shooter so i'm hoping that'll develop over time yeah, I, I think that's definitely something he, that's that's gonna he needs to develop. But as you as you mentioned, like he has a he has a lot of winning traits already. Like he reminds me a lot of Andre Iguodala. Like I, I want I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on that comparison. But um, with just his again, like he's dynamic, he's athletic, but he has good feel for the game. Like really good cutter. Uh, he had a lot of plays where he was cutting baseline for lobs. Um, can can play. He has enough ball handling to potentially not create for himself, but you know, uh, you know, attack a closeout, get downhill, and then make the right read. So I, I feel like he's he's like he can be a, a connector, but at the highest level, which is um, what Andre Godala was for Golden State, like a really high level starter. And so obviously that's going to depend. That's going to be dependent on you know can he can he get a scoring skill or a scoring uh, ability to score. Because uh, that's what you need ultimately to stay on the floor. Uh, but he has, again, as you mentioned, like incredibly athletic, really dynamic defensively. Uh, uh, there are a lot of things to like about him. Yeah, I mean, if, in order for Asar to hit that Asar, I mean, sorry, Asar Thomas to hit the Andre Iguodala level, um, he's yeah, he's deaf because Andre Iguodala before he got to you know Golden State, at the, that was like the end of his career pretty much. He was like a 18, 19 point per game score in 2005 oh, yeah. to 2008. Wait, um, I'm talking like, strictly Golden State Iggy. Because, like, obviously, you're right. Like, Iggy, he was an all star before Golden State. It's not like I Golden think so, State yeah. was career. He was like a one time. Um, but I think like, he'd be like a Golden State Andre type of mold at his best. Yeah, but, like, he probably should. I think we should aim higher with him. Um, higher, I, want, okay. I, I don't want it to, like, bog him down, like, hey, this is your role. Like, I want him to be, like, if you want to be Iguodala, like, you know. I want him to average 18, 19 points per game, two steals, right. half a block, like five, four assists. Like, I think that's that's plausible. Um, Can, my, my question, though, is like, could he, like, he's still, again, we talked about, he's very much a project on the scoring side. Could he, could he find that, that ability is the question. I think just he's going to be able to, like, just pick up buckets off, like, cuts, offensive rebounding. Um, and like you say, for like five, six years down the line, I think there's going to be some element of self creation in his game. If not, I think that would be pretty disappointing. But he's just so early in his career. I think it's gonna it's gonna work out from a, a scoring perspective, um, just with how athletic he is, the, his feel for the game. Uh, maybe not eighteen, nineteen might be a little ambitious. Maybe if he's like fourteen, fifteen. Um, I think that's Golden State Iggy, man. That's Golden State Iggy. That's well, Golden State Iggy was like under ten points a game. But because he, what he's coming off the bench, the playoffs, like we saw what you saw, he was in the finals. He could be a guy that could scale up and, and average, you know, 16 a game in the playoff series. Like. Yeah. But my thing is, like, if you don't think Asar is going to be a guy where he's like a one time all star, okay, I, I, I see, I see what you're saying. Like, in terms of he's strictly Golden State 
Iggy, like the type of role he plays, but I just don't think he'd be as good at that role as Iguodala. I don't know if that's what you're asking. I, I think no, I, I think you definitely like it, Golden State Iguodala, right? Let, let's talk about it. It's like it was he he was like high field guy. we obviously number one defense, very, really good on ball defender, but offensively, I feel like the kind of things we've been describing with Asar was the kind of things Andre was really good at, like the cutting, the passing, uh, occasional creation. Um, you know, I feel like a lot of that speaks to what Asar could do. Obviously, Golden State Iggy, he just wasn't uh, a star because he just couldn't create at the highest level, create his own shot. And I think I sort of see similar limitations with, with Asar. Like, that, that's sort of where I was going with that. Okay. No, I, I can agree with that then. Yeah, I was just – yeah, I was thinking – when you said Iguodala, I was thinking of, like, the Philadelphia Iguodala. Um, oh, I mean, I'd, li- I'd love to see – I think Amen might have a better chance at hitting that level. He's a little bit more – he's a better with the ball. Um, mm-hmm. Asar probably not – is not to that level. Um, but yeah, I, I just really like his game a ton. And he, he's a guy as like – if I was running a team, like, I, I even though he can't really shoot the ball, I, I'd still go after him because I think he really – Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ron Holland too. I, I don't know how much you've looked into him. I had him number one or number two on my board. Um, I thought he was probably the best driver advantage creator in the draft. Um, shooting's not great, but I didn't think his form was like super broken. So I, I think at some point he'll be a decent shooter. That's just kind of my bet. Um, but you know, really, really great driver. Not as big as you want. Like if he was like six eight like a pure four size, I think he would be in a lot better spot, but he's more like six, five, six, six, more like two guard size. So that's a little bit problematic. Um, I don't, and also I don't know, like Asar and Ron Holland together in the short term, I don't really know if it's going to work. And if that's the case, like they might just move on from one in order to, for development reasons. Yeah. Yeah. And I, again, I, I hate, I hate to, you know, harp on an old point again and again, but again, they have their wing room is really crowded this year, just in, in general, like, we we brought up uh, you know Beasley, um, it was Beasley, Tobias Harris, um, and uh, who's last guy? Was and Tim Hardaway, but Shimone Fontecchio was also a guy that they brought in last year, and he's a, he's a winning player. So I think like all those guys are going to be competing for minutes, Ron Holland included. Um, so I think that's my concern with him because he's again they have a lot of guys that need development, need touches. Ron is definitely one of them. I just don't know if he's going to get the opportunity. I mean, yeah, they have – yeah, Simone Fontecchio I think is pretty, pretty, a pretty good player, a good pickup for them. Um, but they don't have a ton of wings, do they? I mean, you have – I'm looking at Asar, Ron, Simone Fontecchio. Like, Tobias – I mean, Beasley and Hardaway are really are wings, so. Yeah, yeah. But, like, positionally, they're probably more of, like, a two than you want them playing the three. So mm-hmm. I think there's still there's 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 room for him to play. Um, okay. mm-hmm. I, I don't know at what point that you decide. Hey, we're gonna go with this guy. I mean, maybe that'll sort itself out as the year goes. Maybe just one of them is just t- so undeniably good that like, mm-hmm. okay, this is the guy we're going with. Um, yeah. the Paul Reed's on this team. I didn't know that. Paul, Paul Reed's there. Yeah. Not about that. Yeah. You want to get the, the Jalen Duran? Speaking of centers, or do you want to you want to finish this point on one on? Oh, no, I think we're going on Holland. Yeah. Uh, Jalen Durant, I think he was top five in rebounding last year. Um, and he tried to put the ball on the floor a little bit. There was that – last year in Summer League, remember when they played him and Wiseman together in the front court? They were doing that in the regular season this past year. Oh, my gosh. Really? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. No way. It, it wasn't very good from uh, – they, they had flashes, but, I mean, it was, it was, a, it was one of their – I think worst lineup combinations. I gotta run yeah, that makes sense game. because you don't really have the the requisite guard play to make that even work in the first place. Yeah. So, uh, but I think his shooting touch is actually pretty good. Like, I, I he is pretty good touch. Like his free throw shooting, I think, is pretty solid. Um, yeah. like decent passing vision. Um, I don't know if he. Do you think he's gonna be as versatile as like a, a Wendell Carter, like that type of guy? Like, do you think he can get to that level? When it comes to Wendell, you're talking like. His, just like Wendell's um, ability, like when, like Wendell can you know shoot it a bit, play make DHO hub, put the ball on the floor, like can Jalen Duran get to that level? Um, not the shooting. I think the shooting we still have to see, but I think in terms of being able to you know like you said ball handle and uh, you know basically uh, 
you know, be, be a screen and roll guy, but it can also run handoffs. I, I think he definitely do that. And I think he's already been doing that. Um, like he kind of reminds me of, of Bam Adebayo just because they're both mm, yeah. undersized. Even Wendell also fits. No, I don't think Jalen Duren's undersized, dude. He's 6'8". Jalen Duren? Yeah, he's like, or is no, he he's or 6'10", right? No, Jalen he's Durant. like 6'11", always 6'10". Yeah. I but mean, he's 6'10", 250. I don't know if that's undersized. Oh, right, right. He, he's got, he like, you know. He doesn't look undersized. He, or, yeah, no, you're right, you're right. But undersized me, he's not a footer. Like, uh, oh, yeah, like exactly. Bam, Bam out of body, similar, like 6'10". If, he, if he's a, actually, no, Dwight, I would say Dwight Howard is seven, but Dwight Howard was 6'10". Okay, maybe I'm just bugging on this then. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess yeah, you're right. Like even if uh, uh, Jalen Duren, he's he's incredibly athletic. Um, so I, I honestly, that way, I think he has a, a leg up on Wendell. Like he he, he can be more of a traditional big than Wendell, oh, yeah. just because I think he's more athletic. But more. in terms of being versatile, I think he definitely fits that mold of, of Wendell and uh, and Bam. Like again, the passing, ball handling, um, you know, touch. Which again, like you, you, even if he is like six ten going up against seven footers, like you need that. Uh, when when the rim is taken away, you need those in between um, scoring opportunities, and I think what he he's on he's on his way to developing that. So I think he can definitely be up there with those guys. I just realized we've been talking for twenty five minutes about the Detroit Pistons. We have two more teams yeah. to talk about. Um, yep. Let's answer our final question: Are they going to be in this bottom tier or bottom three teams next year? This is tough, I, actually. This is tough. I, I'm going bold here. I'm saying no. I think okay. I think they're finally ready because again they have the, they have the they have some winning pieces. Cade's there during another step. As long as they're healthy, I think they get out of here. Yeah, it, it really depends on the buying because I think if you win on the margins a bit, it, it, and Bickerstaff has experience doing this. Like he had like a very odd construction Cleveland team when they had Lowry Markin at the three, and that really worked out for them. Um, so I think there's potential for that to to work out. So, you know, I'll agree with you. I'll say no. I think they're going to be above this level. I don't – play-in might be a little ambitious, but um, I don't think they'll be in this cellar. All right. Agreed. All right, we can move on to the Washington Wizards. Um, Jordan Poole, town. Yeah, now that's the team I watched the, the most last year, fun fact. Oh, you must be an fact. expert, man, because I did not <laughs> watch them last year. Well, def- yeah, it was, it was a little sad, but – Sort of give an overview. Uh, yeah, you mentioned Jordan Poole. Uh, he's one. He was their, you know, he's he's a guy they envision as being a part of the their, this core that they're trying to build. They have Jordan Poole. You have Kuz. Um, they just drafted Alex Sar. Um, what pick was that? Uh, number number two. Number two overall pick. Uh, you have Alex Sar. Um, anyone else in that in that young core that I'm I'm missing? Let's see. Um, I, I, or they just, Bub Carrington as well, second lottery pick uh, from last year's draft. Bilal Kulabali from last year. So they're, they're a really young team, clearly. Uh, and they don't really have a sort of established, you know, a guy where they're trying to build around. Kind of like and no, no one really like a, a Wemby or like a Cade Cunningham. I think they're still trying to figure that out. Um, Jordan Poole. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I love JP more than anybody, but uh, – yeah, I mean, as your number one focal point, yeah, that's not happening. Um, at least, you know, we'll see. But I don't think they envision him like that, is what I'm saying. But, I mean, they made some moves in the offseason. They brought in some, some uh, you know, vets. Uh, most notably, Jonas Valanciunas. They, they gave him the bag. Uh, I think it was like three years, 33. Uh, nothing crazy, but he's, he's a guy that, that brings that stable presence as a big. Uh, you know, can run, pick, and roll, post up, whatever. Uh, brought in Malcolm Brogdon as well. Um, I forget it was, it was Denny Avia trade. trade. Denny Avia trade, yes. So this was, um, yes. Uh, and so you know they they have they they brought some vets around the margins, which is I think pretty big because last year they were young without without that veteran presence, and so I think that already gives them a leg up this year. Um, but you know they're young. Um, that's 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 just the state of Washington. Yeah, as an overview. Yeah. Um. Bilal Koulibaly has been a guy I've been interested in. What do you think of him as a defender? Do you think he's like that elite? Yeah. I I think he's he's good. Like I yeah, I wouldn't say elite, but I think he has the opportunity to to be some be someone special on that side because his his measurables are ridiculous. Like yeah. he's uh, what is it six 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 seven with a seven two wingspan. Like 
that that's already exciting, and that was a lot of the appeal even coming into the draft. Um, like what he, what he can do with that size and length, and he he showed flashes last year. Like he had some uh, obviously what he can do on the ball, but he had some ridiculous blocks as well. Like coming over from the, the help side, swatting guys at the rim. Uh, he can be a really versatile defender uh, on that side. Um, but what was exciting was like he he was really raw coming in offensively, but he looked pretty comfortable on that side. Yeah, of he looked better than I thought he was gonna. You'd say so, right? Yeah. Like obviously he wasn't. He, again, he wasn't like he was a you know he was a killer offensively or anything. But just in his in his limited role and his in his usage, like his his jumper looked good. Like he ended the year on thirty five percent from three, but uh, his highs were were pretty good. Like he was able to knock down that catch and shoot. Um, you know, seventy percent from the line isn't great, but um, showed signs of, of having some a working jumper. Uh, was it, it, and also with Washington, touches were, were galore, so he got some opportunities to take some pull-up jumpers, um, handle the ball a little bit just in general out of pick and roll, and he looked pretty good on that side as, as well. So um, really gave Washington a reason to, to stick with him down the line. Yeah. Is he going to start at the three next year for them? I'm just looking at their roster, and I feel like he's kind of the like, one true wing guy. I mean, Kuzma, I, but yeah, in terms of being like a him, him three. Kispert. Yeah, I'd say him and Kispert are the – the, the two guys okay. they have at the uh, I, I think I'd say he starts like last year that was tricky like I I think train Denny probably had to do with what Washington thinks of well like I think he, he's definitely a guy that they they envision as their starting group. yeah that's a good point um yeah. we can move on to their number two overall pick this past year for the Wizards Alex Saar um yeah. I looked a bit into Saar's passing in particular because, um, you know, offensively, he had a, a pretty rough summer league. He had the game where he missed every field goal attempt. Um, I think some of that is going to improve once he plays next to, like, real NBA players that are better. Um, I think he's going to look a lot better offensively. Because a lot of the stuff, too, he was, just, he was forcing it. Like, he didn't look comfortable. Um, I think he's going to be a lot more well-adjusted coming to the year. So I wouldn't expect him to be that bad offensively. Um, but his passing to me would actually really stood out um and i know that this is not like brand new information like i know people who really really do scouting like they noted like hey this guy has pretty good feel as a passer um but he was making some like great reads like off the move um like you know someone slips the screen he knows it's coming before the screen set you know that's just something intuitive that comes um and you know sometimes with bigs like when they're passing the ball like it's just it's just like a second late. It's, you know, it doesn't always come on time with him. It's like, you know, he, he's moving it. Like, you know, it, it's getting out, it's getting out quick when it needs to. It's not like a little late. It's off target. Okay. There's not really anything off this anymore. Um, he was making the right weeds reads. It was, it was relatively fine in terms of placement and all that. So um, that really stood out to me. And I, I think that's going to be huge for him playing at the four, because if he was just like, you know, kind of tunnel vision at the four spot, that's a little bit problematic. You probably need him to play the five, but with him having that passing vision, I think his shooting and ball handling, that's all going to work itself out. Like he could play the four long term. Um, I think, I don't think he needs to necessarily play the five and that kind of solves the thing where like, Hey, like he's a solid, he's a solid rim protector, but he doesn't have like a crazy, crazy plus wingspan. Like some people do. Um, so that'll allow you to play like a Jonas next to him or just another big next to him. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. No, that, that's a, that's a good point. And I think, um, again, like with, with someone like, with like him, the, the, the skill necessary uh, it, it, to play the four, if he, if he's sliding into that spot, it's pretty important. Do you think that it, it's going to, it's, it's, he's, he's, would you say he's definitely more of a project and then like a work in progress? With, with oh that? yeah. Yeah. In terms of weight, in terms of what? This is his scoring skill set. Oh, yeah, 100%. Like, his shot's not super consistent right now. He's not making the right decisions. That also just might be summer league. He's forcing it. I'm not going to – I didn't watch it. I didn't watch him in the NBL. Like, I don't I don't really know how he was there. But I know there he was a lot more limited of a role. Um, mm-hmm. If he's going to play, like, a lot more of an expanded role in the NBA, there's definitely ways to go for him. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. So it's going to help him having like Poole and Kuzma, even Valanciunas next to him. I think mm-hmm. that's going to be beneficial. For sure, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, honestly, if you just look, I mean, Bub Carrington is a, is a young guy on the team. I'm not even going to talk about Johnny Davis, unfortunately. Um, mm-hmm. Keyshawn George was 
was okay. Like looked decent. So I don't think he was like terrible. Um, but Bob Carrington looked pretty good. I thought. Um, the shooting, right? For him, yeah. shooting ball handling. Yeah, and he was just making the right plays all the time. You know, he wasn't forcing stuff, looked pretty composed, poised, took what the defense gave him. Right. Um, like what I saw from him, for sure. And he's a late bloomer type, too, so a lot of stuff ahead of him in terms of okay. uh, becoming a great player. Yeah, that's great. That's your Jordan Poole replacement. Down the line, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, got, they got options. But yeah, besides them, though, like they don't really have anyone that's like, oh, yeah, this is like another great young player to add to their core. Mm-mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the question. Mark. They're still trying to figure that out, I think. And maybe that's that's what next year's draft is for. Like, if they'd be bad this year, then, you know. Unless you, you are post-hype Marvin Bagley. Or what? Yeah. I mean, Marvin Bagley, he's turned, he, he played well. But, yeah. yeah. He turned his career around, but, yeah, I mean, it's it's tough. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think he's actually a solid backup center, like pretty versatile, yeah. skilled. I think yeah. for him more, it was like an attitude thing. Um, yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Well, not, not honestly attitude thing, like mental thing with him, mm-hmm. just like trying to figure out what his role is in the niche in the NBA. Mm-hmm. And yeah. like, you know, having all those guys come after you too, like you have Luca coming after you, Trey Young, like, it's you tough. know, it's tough, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, anything else to add about the Wizards? Um, I mean, really minor storyline, but could be something big. I think Corey Kispert is a really, he's a, he's a winning player. And so, I mean, it's, I don't think it's not going to pertain to them in any kind of way, but I think he's definitely a guy that teams like winning teams should look at as, as a guy to trade for, because his value is pretty low. I think he's a really good connecting wing. Um, could, could really help a team out in, in that regard, but yeah. I think got. How's his defense? Um, I, he's, he's six, five and limited athletically. So there's, there's definitely causes for concern, but I'd say he's, he's pretty strong. Okay. Uh, he's pretty big. So I think he could, he could, you know, in a switching kind of system where he doesn't have to move as much or uh, navigate screens, you know, there's, there's a chance that he could, uh, he could be a, a, a decent, a decent additive addition to a defense, but, um, it, it, I think he's still going to be a negative in any system. Okay. But I, what I like about him, just really quick, is a good shooter that can put it on the floor, make the right reads. Um, it, it's, he's, a, he's a versatile offensive player as a connected piece. So. Yeah. Um, all right, final question. Is this team going to be in this tier next year, bottom of the Eastern Conference? I say yes. Uh, yeah, unless the Jordan Poole finally fulfills my life, lifelong dream and becomes an all-star. Uh, yeah, I think they're going to be here. Yeah. Wait, can you repeat that part? Your audio just made the weirdest sound I've ever heard. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, I said unless Jordan Poole fulfills my dreams and becomes an all-star, finally. Uh, <laughs> they're going to be stuck here. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Um, all right, we can move to our last team of the these the bottom feeders of both conferences, the Charlotte Hornets. Um, just recently hired uh, Charles Lee as their new head coach. They got a little bit revamping of their uh, um, of their front office. If you got, everyone should go watch their behind the scenes content on their YouTube. It's it's great stuff. Did you have you seen it? Yep. Yep. Of course Charles, you have. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> you have. Yeah. I'm a psycho. Yeah. I, I he was so while everyone was prepping for summer league when he was at the USA basketball camp. Like I saw him there. You know he and he was going back and forth between training with his summer league team in uh, Charlotte and also coming to support Brandon Miller at Team USA because Brandon Miller was on the select team. So he was flying back and forth. So you can really tell this guy's a a grinder. Um, He's been in the running, too, for a lot of some other head coaching jobs I've opened up. So, um, And, you know, he said all the the right things. So I'm I'm pretty excited about him. It's cool, too, you know, having, you know, a younger guy that maybe can connect with the players more versus, like, some, some, like, you know, kind of like the old guard type of coach in terms of Steve Clifford. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, if you can get the players to buy in to play some defense, I think this team will be all right. Cause they were in the play in a couple of years ago. Two years ago, man. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, but you know, LaMelo ball has been injured a bunch. So, I mean, that's a huge reason why, but, um, but they, 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 need to, acquired... they need a culture change though. Mm-hmm. And he's going to help with that. They need a culture change. Yeah. I mean, I just can't believe that like, they're, they're looking at like Atkinson, Atkinson backed out. And then you go back to Steve Clifford, like, yeah, I don't know I about mean, that one. Yeah, and Steve, I mean, I think Steve himself stepped down because he just said it. It, it just it, was, it just wasn't enjoyable experience for him, like coaching, just in general. So, 
I mean, maybe it's probably probably for the best that yeah. they were able to start fresh, clean slate this year. Yeah, we Wait, stop, uh, your, your audio your audio is cooked right now. Oh my goodness. Okay. Uh, I, I can it's repeat like, that. It's like making these maybe turn off the echo cancellation. Okay. Okay. Hold on. It it doesn't let me. Dude, your audio is actually cooked right now. What it's happened? Right you you didn't touch anything? No. Mm-mm. God, why is it doing that? It's just like super weird. Okay, it's, it's bad. It's still bad right now. No, no, no it's fine now. But as long as you talk, it's just like it, I don't even I don't even know how to describe what it sounds like. <laughs> like basically, you're like a robot. That's what it sounds like. Oh shit. Okay. Yeah, it's fine now though. Okay, we'll okay. just keep going. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, let me know if there's anything. Just like put up a hand or something. Stop. Okay. okay. Um, right. Yeah, I, I guess for you, was there anyone in particular or anything you dove into specifically with this team? Yeah, I mean, I just honestly, I, I just looked into Mello a lot because, again, he's their focal point. I haven't really watched him as much. And, uh, I mean, Mello, obviously, he's – he's. it's not like he's he's still uh, – he's still up and coming, but he's he's done things in the league. Like, he's he's been an all-star. He's led his team to a postseason appearance, even though it was a playing game. Like, he's established as is. And, um, you know, he's, he's a guy that can that can really fit any style. Uh, obviously, uh, he, his, he, he kind of reminds me of Tyrese Halberton where, you know, the guys that are – you know, exciting, great passers, but, you know, they, they excel with pace. And so I think uh, a big thing for them next year is, you know, can they play fast? Uh, you know, can, can they buy into that aspect? Because, you know, Lamelo is he's, he's a gifted, uh, you know, transition player. You need to surround him with pieces that can that can help with that. So, um, you know, that, that, that's the, that was the main thing that I was, that I was thinking about with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been a big Lamelo fan for a long time. Um, remember 2020 should have taken him over James Wiseman. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> should have. Never going to live that one down. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I just like, you know, he, he's a, he's a creator that needs to have the ball in his hands, but he gets off the ball quick though. That's why I like, he doesn't hold on to it. Um, I'm not a huge fan of like, I mean, I know Luca's Luca and he'll do his thing, but I'm, I'm more of a fan of guys that are going to like get off the ball a lot quicker. Um, helps everyone like stay engaged. And I think it's just a more pleasant style to watch and like pleasant style to play with. So I think mm-hmm. like long term, I think those are always like a good way to look at basketball. Um, For sure. But you know, yeah, I, I think he definitely can be their franchise player. I mean, let's see if they can get some buy in from him in terms of like being a defender. Because there's times where you look at him like, okay, this he's not doing terrible on defense right now. Like it's all right, and he has positional size good hands like super sneaky in terms of just like like he he has that knack for just like getting steals you know just like finding ways to poke the ball free and things like that um but yeah overall the defense this team really struggles i think having josh green as a like a point of attack navigator type guy i think that's gonna give him a lot of um help on that end because just terry rozier last year at that spot was just getting cooked like just so much separation all the time and he has no he's like six one and he's yeah. also thinking about what he was going to do on the other end too. <laughs> Straight buckets. That's yeah. <laughs> um, so I think Josh Green there is going to help a lot. For sure. Um, for me on on this team, I looked into Brandon Miller a bunch. I'd say I looked into him the most out of anyone we've talked about today. Um, but so th- this is where I got the whole idea of what we were talking about earlier with the Portland Trailblazers in our last episode with the whole screen setting thing. Nick Richards and, and Mark Williams hasn't played a ton, so I don't really know. Nick Richards is not a good screener at all. Like, it, like no wonder why Brandon Miller like can't get to the rim at all because like, he's slipping out of everything, and like guys are just able to like get through. Um, so one thing I, I picked up on was every time like Grant Williams was involved in Brandon Miller in terms of him being like a screener, like a Gortat screen, on ball screen, anything it just opened things up for Brandon Miller so much more because Grant Williams is like really good at getting contact and holding it. Um, so that really opened stuff up for Brandon Miller. And, and Grant Williams isn't a guy you think of, Hey, this is like the guy that I, I guess maybe a little bit, he might be your screen setter, but like you don't always think about him that type of role, but I think he's actually really solid at that. I mean, you just look at him too. He's super strong. Like, mm-hmm. and you know, it's hard, <laughs> hard to find around a guy like that. So mm-hmm. I, I think, Having integrating him as a screen setter for the Hornets, I think is really going to help. Um, 
Yeah, I think I think that's why Grant Williams, I think, is is he is a pretty valuable player. He he just does a lot of those little things super well, um, screen setting, rebounding, defending. Like he's not like super naturally gifted in one way or another, but he just like does all those little stuff so well for you. Like it just makes everyone's lives a lot easier. But it's just, you don't see it right away all the time. For um, sure, and I think they they got a couple guys like that. Maybe um, they don't contribute in the same way, but I think they, guys that can they can bring winning habits to this team. Like, uh, Michich is, is a guy that really played well for him last year. Obviously way overextended with his role with LaMelo out, but, um, hear me? You're good now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, So I think Michich is a guy, reliable ball handler. Uh, you know, Cody Martin can play, Seth Curry. Um, you know, Taj Gibson is really good. He's not going to play, but he's, he's a good locker room guy. Like, there's a reason he's still sticking around the league, so... I mean, again, speaking on the, the I think culture is the biggest thing for them to establish, and you know maybe those vets can play a role for them. Josh Green too. I mean, Josh Green's coming from Dallas, where you know, uh, I mean, I don't know, Dallas has like exceptional culture, but you know, they're in the championship this past year. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's something. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Trey Man too. I think we both are big Trey Man fans too. Uh, his step back's nasty. He gets so much separation on it. His movement is just different. One of the nicest like, cutbacks in the league. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like they, they got they got some talent. I mean, it, it his definitely... animation in two K and his step back is crazy. <laughs> He's glitchy. He's like that in real life. So it, it is. It literally is. Like he gets so he like hops backwards. I'm like, oh my gosh! Like he gets so much separation. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was um, curious, like. But I guess I kind of got off the Brandon Miller thing. I started talking about Grant Williams instead of Brandon Miller. Um, but yeah, he was so the, the whole thing with Brandon Miller, like out of I was looking mainly at his pick and roll reps. So gets his mid range knockdown. Like he's a knockdown mid range shooter. Um, doesn't really probably can hunt the three a little bit better. I think that'll come with time as he just kind of understands the game a little bit better. Um, also has better screening too, please. But in terms of passing, right? Um, he wasn't, he wasn't great at that out of pick and roll. Like, it's just, I don't, I, maybe, you know, next year with this whole screen setting thing, that'll, it'll open things up for him. But, um, yeah, a lot of times he's looking for his own shot, getting to his mid range stuff like that, which I think is fine, but to get to like a higher level, you're obviously going to be able to pass out of that. And also just, he doesn't really get to the basket a ton out of pick and rolls, um, I think only about 3% of his pick and roll possessions, he got all the way to the rim, but you know, their spacing wasn't great. So there wasn't a ton of room for him to work. Um, are you still there? Yeah. 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 Can you hear me? yeah. Yeah. Your like video was just like lagging super bad. Oh, okay. He's got, he's got to get to the end. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I think Brandon Miller is great. Like, I think he's a great fit next to Melo as well. Guy can play really well on and off the ball. Um, he, you think this, this, you think Brandon's a guy that can rack up? That can, what do you think his ceiling is, basically, down the line? Hmm. Yeah. No, that's something I I kind of go back and forth on because if you want him to be, like, there's two pathways. Like, either he's gonna have to become like an elite elite shot creator, which I actually th- I think that's possible with him. Um, I mean, he's like super athletic. Um, why don't I say so? he's pretty athletic? can knock down shots, good size. Like the, the potential is there for him to be just like an elite shot creator. Um, but if he wants to get to a higher level than that, whereas like if he, if he adds passing to that mix, like he's an all NBA player, I think. Um, yeah. And I think he's already going to be like a 20 plus point per game score in the NBA. So Maybe if he can add that creation element, I think he's going to be like the easily the number two, Player, maybe even the best player on this team at some point. Like I think that that is definitely possible. Mm-hmm. For sure, for sure. Yeah, and, and th- there's the whole thing about like him not finishing well. Um, I don't, you just see sometimes like if he gets a little bit of like he actually gets space off the screen sometimes. It's like he'll he'll make some like pretty nice finishes actually. Like I don't think his finishing is that bad. Even back to Alabama, I didn't think his finishing was bad. I I don't I didn't know what it what it necessarily was. Like he attacks the rim hard. He'll he'll dunk on some guys, you know. He has that level of athleticism. I just I don't know why the finishing numbers have not always been there for him. Um, maybe the solution is Grant Williams setting screens screens for him. Who knows? 
maybe it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess Miles Bridges, Miles Bridges is the other guy we didn't talk about. He, I think he re-signed uh, for $27 million descending contract until 26, 27. Um, I don't know. I'm not a big Miles Bridges fan. <laughs> not me yeah. either. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe we should just not talk about it. <laughs> I, don't, I, I just also like in terms of future of this team, I don't really know how he fits. Cause offensively, I don't know if he's there enough to warrant like having that big of a negative at the four spot defensively. Um, like, I don't know if he's good enough offensively to justify it. Maybe that's where rookie uh, Tijan on Salon, maybe that's where he slots in. We haven't talked about him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. rookie Salon. We, 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 yeah, I mean, he looked kind of rough in Summer League, I'm not going to lie. But the whole thing with him is, like, you know, he's all these great tools and his, like, motor is super high. Um, and he's been playing professional for a couple of years in, in, in mm-hmm. Europe. So the hope is, like, he'll – He's young, but he'll be able to to develop um, and fill that four spot for them. Yeah, yeah. So can he find that offense? Yeah, yeah that shooting is uh, something he's going to have to definitely work on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, anything else to add? Or, uh, we can ask, answer our last question. Is this team going to be in this tier next year, this bottom three in the conference? I say no. I think they're going to be above it. I agree. I agree. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, potential playing team. I think just because of the talent up top. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, there's some teams going to be talking about these next couple episodes that are going to be down <laughs> here um, next year, uh, aka coop, Chicago coop, and coop. Oakland. Coop yeah. for coop. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I think we can wrap it up here. Then. Yeah. I'll just end it. Oh, actually, wait. I got to record the outro. Dang, I got to do so much editing now. Oh well. <laughs> Wait, did we do an outro for the last podcast? Uh, you said it was really brief. I don't think it was a. Oh, yeah, I don't no. remember. We we can record it. Right? Yeah, my internet. Oh my god, that's a. Yeah, it, it's okay. It's okay. We can. Uh, I'll just end it and I'll just record it on my okay. own later. Yeah.